in this well with me, Nicole Chamberlain. So throughout this presentation, we'll be going over how to get into the flow. So there is a lot of science behind this. And if you're not quite sure what flow is, you definitely will be by the end of this. So we're going to begin with a meditation. So focus follows flow. So the only way into flow is to be completely focused and absorbed in the moment. So begin here with a brief meditation by closing the eyes and getting still in your body. And as you start to close your eyes and get still, you can begin to notice your thoughts. This isn't the time to get lost in the thoughts, but just to simply observe. And we have the two entities within us. We have the watcher, that we just observe. And then we actually have the thoughts themselves. They try to take us out of the moment. Just take a moment here to sit in silence. Bringing your awareness from the silence into your breathing. And noticing your breath filling up into your abdomen. And as you exhale, releasing any tension, any thoughts that arise. Take about three more really deep breaths here, inhaling, filling up the abdomen. And exhale, draw the pit of the belly in towards the back of your spine. Two more here on your own. Slowly blink your eyes open and we'll, we'll uh, go ahead with the rest of the presentation. So what does it take to achieve the impossible? This is what flow looks like, is achieving the impossible. So what does this take exactly? So I want to give you a quick example of the sport of surfing. So surfing is one of you know the very oldest sports. It has been around since 400 AD. And from 400 AD to 1996, which is about 25 years ago, uh, there was very little progress in the sport. Like no one was surfing over a 25 foot wave. And there was actually articles scientifically proven that people were unable to surf over 25 foot waves. Well, if you know anybody who surfs, they love to challenge the impossible. They love to challenge what is possible. And so from the year 1996 to 2020, like I said, 24, 25 years in that time frame, uh, the surfers who are advanced regularly go over 100 foot waves now. And what is the difference? And the difference is flow. And you look into other domains and it's the same thing. Anytime that somebody is doing something that was thought impossible, they are able to get into this consciousness, which is flow. And you'll also see the example of this with the running, where the first time someone was able to run a four minute mile, once that was broken, then a lot of other people were able to do it. I just wanna give you a quick video of this fun wave um, that was over a hundred fo foot, and it's just kind of like a regular occurrence now. Uh, it's still really exciting when it happens. You can even hear the comments in the background. <laughs> Start to swear. Uh, but this is now something that you can just find on YouTube that people are surfing over 100 foot waves or just in you know, 1995, it was totally impossible. So what is flow? If we look at defining flow, exactly what does it look like? So flow is a technical term for an optimal state of consciousness. 
This is when we feel our best and we perform our best. Like I said before, the whole reason we did that meditation in the beginning is so that you are totally absorbed in this moment. You're so absorbed in this moment that you don't get caught off in other thoughts. The other things do not distract you. You're so focused that really everything else disappears. You don't have like the sense of self of what's possible, of what you've done in the past, of what's not possible. Uh, you don't have a sense of time, like how much time do I have left? So every decision, every action flows seamlessly right into the next. And the great thing is, is that it is hackable. And what I mean by hackable is that it's easy to teach people how to do. And here's this beautiful quote I love um, from Long Meme, <laughs> but he basically defines the term flow. And this is that the best moments in our lives are not passive, receptive, relaxing time. The best moments occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. And so here is the godfather of flow, whose quote I just read. And he conducted the largest study of flow. Um, and he found that it is the key to happiness. And so you cannot be happy if you can't get into flow, which is pretty amazing. And so like I said before, it's that total focus. You have one point of awareness on whatever task you are doing. And you do this activity for your own sake you're not doing it for like external reasons you're not doing it to make mom and dad happy you're not doing it to make you know your boyfriend your girlfriend happy and so you're no longer judging every move that you make and you're not even trying to plan it because it's just unfolding into the next moment the flow of science dates back to the 1880s right around when psychology was starting to become big and popular the first is what they found when they were looking into flow is that first they found it's definable. So it's that uninterrupted attention. And there are ways to measure it. So great ways to measure it through the brain. Um, great ways to measure it are through also the heart rate variability. Um, second is universal. So this shows up in everyone and everywhere. So you cannot use the excuse that you are unable to get into flow because you are. And then lastly, it's fundamental. So like we said before with um, the doctor, <laughs> I can't say his last name, Dr. C, we'll call him, uh, is that it, it is important for happiness, right? It's how it makes us feel. Having that moment where like, oh, everything is just perfect. We have these paradigm shifts in our lives and we are five times more productive. So if someone were gonna give you a pill that would make you five times more productive, would you take it? Well, this is slow and it doesn't take medication. So where does it come from? The flow comes from transient hypofrontality. And what transient hypofrontality teaches us is that when we are in flow, we use less of our brain. So that whole using only 10%, you want to use more, that's actually a myth. That's actually wrong. <laughs> so we use less of our brain. So this is an efficiency exchange where we have more um, ability to do things because that inner critic finally shuts off like a part of the brain that is constantly evaluating what we can and cannot do like what time is it that it's totally shut off i'm telling you you can't you get into an alpha brainwave state so the alpha brainwave you know it actually vibrates at about 9 to 13 hertz and you are physically and mentally relaxed but you are still awake it's not that type where like lights are out, nobody's home. If you still are awake, you're still very conscious. And what happens when we get into flow is we finally experience liberation. We are deep into the now, and there's a huge boost in neurochemicals. Time slows down, self vanishes, action and awareness merge. Welcome to flow. This is one of the most interesting things I found in flow is that there's actually neurochemicals that are released. So neurochemicals simply are the way the brain talks to itself and the way the brain talks to the body. And in flow, we get five of the most potent neurochemicals. And these are the best. Right? These are dopamine, norepinephrine, endorphins, uh, anadamide, and serotonin. These are performance enhancing. You are able to take in more information. 
you can uh, recognize patterns much more quickly. You can also think laterally. So you're not thinking the same way as normal. Your risk taking goes up as well as creativity just from having these five neurochemicals released. Right? And they also, um, another one that I didn't list here is that they take away pain. You're not able to feel pain as much. So flow triggers, flow triggers. So ways to get into the flow, uh, individual is what we'll look at and we'll also look at a little bit of group, but you wanna have purpose and passion. So anytime you have purpose and passion behind something, you are automatically gonna be more drawn to it and you're gonna focus on it more. You need to have a time frame of 90 to 120 minutes where you're completely uninterrupted with your attention. So for example, if you're doing a workout, give yourself that 90 minutes. Uh, you know, there's a saying, if you can't say fuck off, I'm flowing, then you will not be able to get into the flow. So go ahead and put that on your door, <laughs> like a little, I'm in the flow, do not disturb. Um, because if you can't have that 90 to 120 minutes, then you are unable to get into flow. And it's so important. Like I said before, it's the key to happiness. You have to take risks. Um, you have to have some kind of novelty where you're getting a little out of your comfort zone. It has to be somewhat complex as well. It can't be super simple. A deep embodiment of the now and so absorbed in the now that just all you notice is what you're doing. Clear goals. So that goals lead to vague results. So have very clear goals around what you want. Pattern recognition and then just building your life around getting into flow. And then when it comes to a group, it's more about having, you know, everybody in the group concentrated, everybody knows the goals, everybody is risking something. There's this close listening to one another. You know, if you think of in comedy, when you're telling a joke, you don't ever want to say no, like improv, you want to say yes. If someone says, you know, oh, like the couch is on fire, you don't say no, it's not. You would go on and be like, oh my goodness, let me go get a bucket of water. Like, let me make this funny. Let me build upon your joke. And so that's where um, having open communication can come in handy, a familiarity with working with what you're doing and with each other. And is everybody participating? You don't want to be in a group where nobody's participating. But that's pretty amazing when you have an individual who's in flow and then you get the group to work in flow too. So ideas are just popping, everybody's feeling engaged uh, and in the moment. So there are four different parts to the flow cycle. So there is a cycle to it um, that we, makes it even more hackable. So first you have to go through a struggle. So struggle is a good thing and it's a prerequisite for flow. This is where you're downloading all the information you need so you can piece together whatever your challenge is. And the harder the challenge, the more of an opportunity you have, you have to get into a flow. So this is why we love challenges and we step right up into them where we don't run away because there we go, there's an opportunity to get into flow. And be thrilled that you get to build this muscle. So the struggle comes in that 90 to 120 minute frame. And that's why it's so important that you can't have anybody bothering you. You can't have any distractions like your phone. Remember you're in that I'm in flow, do not disturb mode. The second part is probably my favorite part is the release. This is when you get to let go of everything you're struggling to achieve. If you're feeling like you're hitting a wall, like if you're writing, you have that writer's block, that's a good thing. This is when you want to stop what you're doing, return to that meditation that we did in the beginning, take a few deep breaths, and then walk away from whatever it is that you've been working on. And then boom, you've entered the flow. Uh, real quick, I want to go back to this phase re release. So great things you can do would be go for a walk, take a nap, maybe cook something, read something uh, that's not on the topic you are working on. The only thing that you cannot do in the release phase is watch TV. So for whatever reason, the release phase, if you watch TV, um, you will not be getting into the flow after. So you struggle, you release, and then boom, you're in the flow. So you want to go back to the task that you're working on and this struggle that you did that gives way to release gives the space for flow. So you're feeling your best, you're performing your best and 
even more importantly, your blood, your brain is now flooded with those neurotransmitters, the neurochemicals that we talked about. And then fourth, and most importantly, is the recovery phase. So because we have those five really potent neurochemicals that are released, this takes a big toll on our nervous system. Right, it re requires a lot of nervous, um, a lot of resources. And without the proper recovery, you can't be ready for that struggle phase again. So this is where we repl replenish minerals, vitamins, we take sleep, water, so that we can be ready for that next phase of struggle, start it all over again. So try this before you um, getting into flow, just taking three deep breaths, focus all your attention into the now, and then slowly and deliberately go about your activity, making it really like a meditative practice, and just remain alert and not allowing your mind to slip off into unconscious chatter. So Buddhists would practice mindful living to get into the flow. They do it through sweeping, washing, walking, mopping. And what they realize is there are no mundane moments, but there are only mundane states of mind. And with practice, the same piece that is embodied with flow starts to just translate into every part of your life. So time for you to go practice and to get into the flow. And before you do that, here's some quick questions, the inquiry uh, that you can go through to just check in. Like, what are your goals? Do you have a specific time frame for your goals? And then what are your reasons why? Think about why are you passionate about this goal? We want emotional, not intellectual. And then go ahead and write down your main distractions. Yeah, once you've done all this, you'll be ready to get into your workout, get into your training session, and get into the flow. So thanks so much for joining today and have a great, beautiful day.